Okay, uh, so we will continue with our next topic, which is texture mapping uh, in the computer graphics, introduction to computer graphics class here. Uh, so let's begin that action now. Okay, so what we have here is, uh, one second. Okay, so what we have here is uh, the texture mapping PowerPoint uh, that I borrow from OWS and I am Yusuf Sahili, all your instructor. Uh, and until now, we, we have been dealing with this rendering uh, problem. Uh, and we have seen ray tracing to put good colors to each of our pixels in the image plane. And so far, we were able to select the colors using the base color of the model. So there is this flat color that applies to every region of the model. And we were restricted to that uh, color space uh, because we assumed that object have fixed RGB reflectance values. Uh, and we also do some tricks uh, using the light directions as well as the normal surface orientation to get uh, nice uh, shading results based on the fixed color. So this is still acceptable, but we can do even better, uh, especially for tasks uh, in video games and et cetera, where we need uh, multiple colors for a given same object. We will need uh, a better mechanism to render our stuff. And here, uh, texture mapping comes to the picture. Uh, we do it using texture mapping. The idea is uh, to simulate reflectance characteristic of objects by using images. So we will borrow the colors from images. In this example, that image is uh, this piece. Uh, and uh, when we map it to the surface, we effectively give colors to the surface point using this image. So there is no fixed one brown color as we see in this base example. Uh, we will borrow the colors from the texture. This is a cheap and effective way uh, to spatially vary surface reflectance. And there will still be some highlights. So all and uh, diffusion, shading. So all the stuff we discussed uh, previous week applies uh, here as well. By, and naturally they apply. We don't do anything special. We just get, we just replace the base color with uh, the colors uh, coming from the textiles, texture elements of our text, texture. Uh, and here we can see the benefit of it immediately. Like uh, the video game example I have given before, uh, it is now even more apparent, I believe, using the same color, it will still be good, uh, but this one is definitely better, more realistic. You can give uh, a better story with this uh, rendering. Okay, so by the way, I can still get this effect without any texture mapping, but in that scenario, I need to uh, divide this scene into millions of polygons and assign uh, colors to each of these polygons and then let the, let the light, lighting and surface normals do the reflections, etc. But still the previous step of uh, the design with millions of polygons is cumbersome and difficult. Uh, what we will do instead is I will just use one simple polygon, which is the quads here, okay? Uh, the big picture, or you can even represent this with two triangles, like one right triangle here and one here. It doesn't matter. So uh, we will then map uh, the picture to that polygon. That is the essential idea. As far as the terminology goes, uh, we have uh, a texture, which is an array of values. Uh, 
Uh, and typically we use an image for this two dimensional array of values, uh, but it can be anything actually. It can be even 3D or 1D. Uh, it doesn't matter, but typically uh, when we say text here, we refer to uh, an image. Uh, and from the content of this array uh, represents color, again, a typical uh, scenario, but it can also represent other things like alpha values for transparency or depth values or normal values or displacements to be applied to the surface normals because when I change the surface normals I will effectively change my rendering all the ray tracing action previous week it depends on the normals so you can play with them using texture of normal or displacement information to be used on your normals. Uh, and uh, Texel is like pixel, uh, but it is, it is a generic concept. It is just a single array element. It can be uh, a pixel actually, if you are dealing with an image, but in general, we call it Texel because it can represent other things as we discussed here. And texture mapping is the process of relating texture, this array, to the geometry in my scene. So let's talk about the roadmap here. You have this image uh, or text here in our new terminology. Uh, and the first things first, I will put this image into this UV uh, coordinate frame where U runs from zero one and V also runs from zero to one. Uh, then we can parameterize the surf. Uh, so the next step is uh, I need to associate my coordinates in my 3D geometry with these 2D UV coordinates, okay? So this can be a difficult step, but assume that my shape is a sphere, okay? For the simplicity here, then it can be easier because then I don't really deal with 3D points because any 3D point can indeed be represented by 2D in 2D using two angles. Instead of using X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinates, I will be using two real numbers, one phi and the other theta. Phi makes you move along the equator here, as you can see, as I increase it, I travel along the equator so I can come somewhere here or in this case I just move like 30 degrees and here uh, so it runs from 0 to 2 pi 360 and then when you are okay with that equator movement then you begin your second journey using this theta uh, which runs from 0 to 180 and it will move you vertically in a sense uh, yeah, so effectively, instead of X, Y, Z, I can use phi and theta, uh, which I can just compute using our X, Y, Z coordinates. So in the end, I have indeed a two-dimensional coordinate here in terms of angles. And my task is to map those 2D to my 2D UV, which is a relatively easy job. Uh, actually, here is that uh, action. Remember, U and V, they must be within zero one interval. So, and as we discussed, uh, the phi is running from zero to two pi. So just normalize it with two pi then, okay. And V is running between zero to pi, 180 vertical movement. Hence you can normalize it with the pi and then you subtract it from one. So you still have something between zero and one. Uh, so again, I will show you a generic way to map any 3D point to this UV uh, to the uh, space later. But now I am giving the general roadmap. So we are sticking with the sphere. Now that I have UV in my hand, uh, and these are real numbers, but these to the UV, they don't just give me the texture indices, right? 
because my image can be 800 by 600, something like that, anything. So I have to go, uh, if U is one, I have to go all the way to 800. And if V is one, I have to go all the way to 600, something like that. So to simulate that, I will use the resolution of my image, my text clear image. Uh, NX is like the width, which is 800, and NY is height, which is like 600 in my example. So it, in this example, this is square, so it is not 800 by 600, but anyway. Uh, so when you, you will be getting a fraction of 800 here and put it to your eye, and you will be getting a fraction of your height uh, 600 and put it into J. But still, these are real numbers still because U is real number and X is integer resolution. So the result is a real number, which means that they will land something here. They have a potential to land uh, a non-integer location. So here the boxes I draw are the pixels, extremely zoom pixels. So if this is an integer value in the end, I have that pixel, so I can that use that color. But in general, unfortunately, you will land somewhere between four pixels uh, as you have fractions coming with you. So now you have options. If you land here, so let's zoom it further, you can pick the nearest neighbor. Like I have one, two, three, four, pixel color values in my RGB JPEG image, I can use the RGB of the closest pixel. Or a better alternative is I can interpolate these four pixel color values. So I will get more weight from this guy because I am closer to this guy. So let's talk about that interpolation now. So assume I land at this A point with my IK real number 2D. Uh, uh, numbers. So this is called bilinear interpolation, by the way, because what you do is you first use your eye to interpolate between these colors in the horizontal direction. Okay, so if this is like white and this is black, then you get some dark uh, or light gray here. Again, here you do the same. This is maybe yellow, and this is red. Then you have an orange color here, uh, closer to yellow, so light orange maybe. So now I have two colors in my hand. This is the first part of the bilinear interpolation. I used I component. So I have light yellow and light gray. Now I do is second interpolation, hence the bilinear interpolation, which runs from uh, light gray to light yellow using J value. So I will stay closer to the gray value. Okay, uh, with that, I can get a better interpolation output. Uh, so let's compare them now. It back and forward. Nearest neighbor, that uh, jaggy structure, vanishes with the interpolation tactic. So this is uh, recommended. And I just put them here uh, for a better comparison. So you can even uh, see problems at the uh, non-center locations as well. Yeah, so if you do all these steps, uh, you will be having this 2D uh, texture image on your 3D geometry. If you use a different texture image, obviously you will get uh, a different uh, output. And here, based on our previous study, there is no ambient light in this universe. So there is no bouncing off. So the places without light, they are just black, unfortunately. So if we turn on the ambient light, we will be seeing below here as well. So here in this case, the sun is somewhere here, obviously the light source. Uh, 
so the lack of color here is due to the lack of ambient light in the system. Otherwise, we have a perfect wrap of this sphere with this image. Now let's talk about non-sphere geometry, okay? Like, which is the general case. So uh, I have this 3D model, whatever it is, it is an animal here, but it can be anything indeed. Uh, what you have to do is you need to map this 3D triangle into this 2D triangle here. Or more specifically, I have three 3D points here, A, B, C. I will map them here to A prime, B prime, and C prime. And since I have the connectivity between them, like A to B, B to C in that order, I use the same connectivity so I can get that triangle here. But the real problem here is how can I map that X, Y, Z coordinate of my A point into UV coordinates of my A prime point and similarly for B and C. So it is a big thing to deal with. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. I need a mapping between the texture and objects triangles. Uh, so what are the problems I have? A 3D point on the surface mapped to a location between texels in the texture or pixels in the image. Uh, but in general, we stick with the textile terminology as texture can be anything and non-image as well. So this problem is already handled by the way, currently, I know the solution. You can do your bilinear interpolation to get the, to the correct uh, texture. The remaining problem is a big one. Only uh, uh, three vertices of the triangle are known here, uh, but I need insight points as well to render the inside triangles. Uh, to do that, I will use interpolation. Since we are dealing with triangles here, we can use our friend barycentric coordinates for that interpolation. So that is uh, one of the problems that can still be solved easily. Uh, and we, we will also uh, remember that in the next slide. But there is also a third problem I forgot to mention here in the slide. Uh, it is that how about making that mapping from 3D to 2D? So we will also talk about that a little bit. So now let's attack this problem, this item. Uh, so I have three vertices, A, B, C, and they map to A prime, B prime, and C prime in 2D. Uh, or let's use this notation. Instead of A prime, I will call it U A, U B, and U C, okay? So again, A, B, C here maps to U A, U B, and U C respectively. Uh, then what I can do is uh, I need the UV coordinate for any point. So if, if this is my 3D triangle with A, B, C, okay, uh, then there is this point P and I can represent this point using barycentric coordinate. I will take alpha of A, B, beta of B, and gamma of C. In this case, beta will be bigger. And if you recall, we were drawing these virtual triangles and uh, essentially alpha is equal to this area over the whole area, which is a small thing because it's a small area. For beta, I will be using this area over the whole fixed area. As you can see, it is way bigger than alpha. Yeah, so with that alpha, beta, gamma, and by the way, you don't see any alpha here because we have also discussed it to keep things in the same plane, alpha plus beta plus gamma must be one, which tells me that alpha is equal to one minus beta minus gamma. And when you plug that into uh, 
A alpha plus B beta plus C gamma equation, you will end up with this equation as discussed before. Okay, so you have your beta and gamma in 3D, you know that. You use the exact same beta and gamma in 2D because you still have a proper projection of this triangle. So, and you already know the UA, the coordinates uh, for A, uh, A's projection, U, B, U, C. So with that, you can get any U for any inside point. Okay, so here I do that actually for this U, I create my new U uh, and then use that U uh, to land to a pixel, right? That U is actually this red dot. And then you do your interpolation and get your color for that insider point as well. Now, relating this to the shading model we discussed uh, last week, we see that texture mapping and shading are not mutually exclusive. They are related uh, and Essentially, what you need to do is this CRCGCB, these colors that we have uh, borrowed from the fixed base color, I just replace it with the current color I obtain with my bilinear interpolation of my uh, 2D UV triangle. Okay, that's it. The rest is the same. You do the same diffusion, which gives you darker stuff in the background compared to the foreground. By foreground, I mean the ones closer to the light. You still see your specular highlights. You can still see your shadows, right? Uh, and in this example, there is no reflection. So you don't see that uh, because there is no other object around. Also, maybe this material is not uh, that reflective. Uh, anyway, so e even if I have them, I had them, I will, I could see them here naturally because all texture mapping does is it attacks to this set of uh, color values. It doesn't alter the rest at all. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about this mapping then. So, so far you uh, blindly believe that uh, UA is the projected to the point of A. Uh, again, if this is a sphere, then there is a way to make that connection between spheres, parameters, 2D parameters, and my U and my V. But in general, we don't have spheres. So let's talk about that. Actually, this is a topic that is not directly related to computer graphics. So that's why in this class, they don't really give a lot of detail about this uh, topic uh, typically, but I think this is important. So I, I also teach a digital geometry processing class. Uh, and so I will use those slides now. I will switch to them. Uh, to see that uh, action. So let me download that set of slides. <clears throat> A topic called mesh parametrization. So if we now switch to that uh, part, you will see this 3D, 3D to 2D mapping better. Essentially, so this is a nice illustration, like uh, gives the idea, you have a surface embedded in, embedded in 3D and you want to flatten it into 2D because my 2D JPEG or PNG, whatever, lies on 2D. So let's do this mapping then. Uh, and here, when I talk about this, I make the motivation as this uh, mm. 
unfolding as this flattening leads to texture mapping application. Uh, so let's skip uh, most of the details here and other applications and uh, let's see the stuff in terms of computer graphics. So texture mapping thing we discussed. So essentially you will have this thing then you will. Uh, so if you look at the whole system, by the way, uh, uh, you don't have to get the colors from like earth images or other generic images. You can create your own texture. Uh, so once the components are parameterized to 2D, you have this 2D image and then you paint them here, your technical artist probably. It is easier to paint stuff here and then it is pulled back. Uh, okay, so the so I also talk about that here. Now the system I want to mention comes here. Uh, I will teach you a line linear parameterization method, a linear method that maps 3D to 2D. There are nonlinear alternatives that uh, work even better, but this is a fast linear system that can be solved with a linear solve. Uh, so all we have to do is to fill these uh, matrices in our system. And the general idea is you have this 3D model uh, and assume that it has a boundary like, like what, like that cat I have seen at some point. Okay, so like this. So even if it doesn't have this boundary, you can use some cutting, like you detect a seam, a cut a path, and you can obtain this. But let's assume that we already have a non-closed mesh like this. So this is my boundary. The idea is you will map this boundary to a convex region. In this case, they map it to a quad. Uh, but in general, we map it to a disk because there is an automatic uh, way to do that. So. The, uh, using trigonometry, you can just map the next vertex to the next angle, etc. Um, okay, so this is the first step, the boundary edges, which are, by the way, edges that are incident to only one triangle, right? You can detect this automatically, no one has to tell it to you. So this edge is not a boundary edge because it is incident to one, two triangles. But this guy is, this guy is, and so on. Uh, so you will, starting from here, you will look at its neighbors. So you don't consider these neighbors as they are attached to interior edges. But when you are here, this is your second boundary. Then the, here, this is the third boundary vertex, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and eleven, I guess, in this example, we have eleven. And those elements are these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so the first step is relatively easy, I think, to worry about. And the next step is the uh, part where we need linear algebra, because in the next step, for any interior vertex, I want it to be mapped into. 2D in such a way that it will stay in the center of its one ring neighbors. Okay. Like this guy is in the center of all the vertex neighbors of it. There is also some weighting going on. That's why you don't really see this in the exact center, but for simplicity, assume that they will be in the center. And if you look at here, it's gives the essence of the shape, like these are the eyes, right? Uh, and this is a very low resolution picture, so you don't expect more outputs from here, but still, this is the idea. So let's fill the details now. Boundary vertices of the mesh are mapped to the boundary of a convex region, like a disk. Uh, then the position of the remaining interior vertices are obtained by solving a linear system that puts each 
vertex to the center of its neighbors. So this is the part, disk mapping part. I will come here later. Let's not lose focus. So once you map the boundary to this convex region, again, this is not a disk, but uh, for demonstration, I map the red sear to here. Uh, and this is bijective, meaning that each mapped 2D point corresponds to exactly one 3D point. So no two 3D points maps to the same location because I don't want that, right? If two 3D points map to the same texel, like same 2D location, then I will get the same color for those two vertices that are actually in 3D. So if these are this vertex and this vertex, then I will get the same color like purple and purple, which is not very realistic because this is purple and this is probably a different color, uh, lighter purple maybe, etc. So, but you cannot get that. If you map these two to the same location, you will be restricted to getting the same color for these two different vertices. That's why we want this mapping to be bijective. And this system that I will teach you also handles that. So it is a good thing. So let me tell it over an example. Uh, so this is my example. This is my 3D point cloud mesh. Okay. Uh, and I first map this guy, this guy, one, two here, one prime, two, two here, U2, three to U3, four to U4, etc. Uh, this is easy. And then for the seven, I will map it to the center of two, one, eight, nine, and three, because these are the neighbors of seven here. So let me. It is done with this W matrix. So let me drive it in detail for you. Uh, and to do that, let's first focus on the top part of this matrix. This is the boundary condition. What it does is, so let's go with numbers. So this vertex maps to one, two in 2D, okay? X1, Y2. Two comes here, which is two, three. Three comes here, which is three, three, because Y is the same as this. So I use the same three, but X becomes three. And four becomes four prime, which is like in 2D coordinates, it is four and two, because the height is just two, height of one, and so on. So let's see how I can tell this to my system. Essentially, I go uh, in two different dimensions, like the x dimensions, then I will use boundary coordinations, conditions for the x coordinate, and I will repeat the same for the y coordinate, but it is the same. So I will just focus on the x component only. So v1 prime x, so this is the v1 prime x, which is one. So I will get it like this. I will get only V1 prime from this unknown matrix. So I will solve for this in the end. So one times V1 prime X is equal to one. So this is given. This is the boundary. This is coming from your disk parametrization. This is fixed. Uh, okay, so then V2, V2 prime, is this red point, and I want that x component to be two. Then I will use zero, one, zero, zero, zero. So I will only use this v2 prime from all this big vector, and I will set it to two. Similarly, let's set like six. What is the x component of six? It is two. So the sixth row, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it will get only the v6. One, two, three, four, five, six, with this one here. And it will set it to the sixth entry here, which is two. Okay, so this is how I feel the upper part of the uh, matrix that corresponds to the uh, boundary vertices. 
Now for the interior, I will use this observation. So this is the cool observation. If a point VI is in the center of its neighbors, which is these four guys in this example, then the sum of vectors from the neighbors to VI, they uh, converge to zero, okay? Like they cancel each other. So let's see a different example, okay, like this. Here VI is not in the center of V1, V2, V3, V4. And if you add up these blue vectors from neighbors to center, it is non-zero, right? Like this part dominates. But uh, remember my goal is to put VI to the center of its neighbors for all I. So let's take an interior vertex V7. It will map to V7 prime, right? V7 prime here. So what do I have in my hand for V7 prime? I will look at all the vectors from neighbors to V7, like uh, V1 to V7, V2 prime to V7 prime, V3 prime to V7 prime, V8 prime to V7 prime, and V9 prime to V7 prime. Remember, 9, 8, 3, 2, 1, these are the neighbors of 7. So these are not arbitrary numbers. And I want this sum to be 0 because of the intuition here. So let's put that 0 here, OK, here. So for V7 prime, if you rewrite this equation, you will see that you will be adding the neighbors one by one. So I will put a 1 to import that neighbor into my system, like V1, V2, V3. No four, no five, no six, no seven, and eight and nine. Okay, so eight and nine, they come because of these two guys. So I have those addition, but also I accumulate minus uh, V7s, and the amount of V7s is equal to the amount of uh, the neighbors, the number of neighbors, which is five in this case. Okay, so this is how you fill your W matrix. So it will impose this equation in your system. And notice that in this equation, I have uh, one prime X, one V2 prime X, V3 prime X, which are already set here, but this, this solves it globally. So as it uh, solves for that, it also, uh, takes this into consideration. Like when you write the equation for V8 prime, it will use uh, data that is overlapped by this equation. But this is the beauty of linear equations. So once you feed them all, if there is a solution, then it will find the global solution that satisfies all of them. Okay, so with that, I have my X components of my 2D mapping that I will use in my texture mapping. And that's it actually, and that's the whole deal. It is not a very complicated algorithm. Once you have this W, X, and B, all you have to do is you run this solver, right? X is equal to W inverse times B. Everything is defined. You get your uh, X components of your 2D here, and then you do it again using Y boundary conditions and Y components. And by the way, there are some tricks like, uh, instead of putting seven to the very center of the neighbors, you may want to put it closer to two because it is closer to two than it is cl closer to one, right? So uh, you can, get that in your system using different weights. So far I have used uniform one weight. You can use trigonometric weights to get better uh, parametrization. But again, this is like out of scope here. So I will stop here. And also mention this boundary parametrization as well. If you remember the first step is boundary vertices of the mesh are mapped to the boundary of a convex region in 2D. Uh, so how to do that? So I get the next boundary loop vertex. Start with a boundary edge, like the one which is incident to only one triangle. Then 
I have the next one and next one. I have an order now. So consider the length of boundary edges, consecutive edges. Uh, so using this length, I can get the next angle. So I will put this, maybe I start, if this is my circle disk, starting from here, then based on this distance between two boundary vertices, I select my next angle, which is like here alpha, and then and put the second vertex here. Then maybe a different alpha, put the third vertex here, etc. Uh, okay, okay. So this is the generic parametrization type that is very useful for texture mapping. Uh, and I will come back to my uh, original graphics slides now. And now we can map any 3D object to 2D, not just this sphere using this mathematical equation, uh, but I can use anything like this dinosaur. Uh, and once I am in 2D, I can do my barycentric trick and I can get my U coordinate and using that U coordinate and V coordinate, I can get my linear interpolation of four neighboring pixels to get the color for that guy. Okay, so this is the heart of texture mapping actually. Uh, for the remaining 20 slides, uh, we will just see variations. So it will be a quicker 20 slides. So let me also finish that in this session to create only one video and I will upload it later. Uh, so that part is about uh, using intermediate objects as uh, to, to, to map. Uh, map the texture onto a simple intermediate surface, like a plane, and then map that plane to your object. So what I mean is the following. So this is your texture, although it is very stupid. Uh, so you can, given your X, Y, Z coordinates in your 3D domain, like the T part here, you drop the Z coordinate maybe. It is totally arbitrary, but for this example, it is like that. And then you get your IJ uh, value and then use it on this text image and get your colors. Or you can use non-planar objects as well, like cylinder, etc. So how about generation of texture? I can just use an available texture from an image, which is a typical way to do. But uh, I can also generate textures procedurally. Uh, so, for instance, this may be interesting, like, I want these stripes on my shape, okay? So how can I enforce it? I can use our friend trigonometry, like, given the, so this is my coordinate frame here, okay? X, Y, and Z looking backwards. So this is like a left-hand coordinate system, but anyway. Uh, so... If you take the sinus of the X coordinates, it means that uh, it will return either positive or negative based on this es escalation, oscillation amount. So if it is positive, then I will get the red color, okay? If not, then I will get the white color. So this teapot is generated using just this simple function. Okay, this is also a texture in a sense. And this one, is it sinus Y or Z? So let's think about it. It looks like Y, right? This is like sinus Y. And this is sinus Z. You can get your checkerboard uh, by combining the X, sinus X and sinus Y now, uh, which will also separate the horizontal part. And you can even play with the width of these bars like uh, by predefining a width parameter. 
Yeah, so that is that actually, not a big deal. Uh, MIP mapping is even more important than the pre procedural text clear generation before. And this is a problem we encounter when the camera is moving a lot, like when it is too close to me, then the polygon that is text clear mapped is larger than the text clear image. And if the camera is too far, then the polygon that is texture mapped is smaller. Mapped is smaller than the image. So what I mean is the following. If the image is this, this is the texture image and this is the pixels, my image plane, I can, if they are of same size, no problem at all. I can just put it here. If the polygon is, this one is the polygon. If it is larger than texture needs to be magnified um, and also the minified version where the camera is far away from me. So let's see the problem with the minification actually. So there is a problem. Let me introduce you the problem. A change of one pixel in image space here, from here to here, causes a change of more than one pixel in texture space. So sorry about that. This is the, uh, image space and this is the texture space. Uh, so then which color should I use from my texture space? And when the difference is bigger, it is an even more complicated situation. So what I have to do is, the idea is you can take the average of these colors, right? But in this scenario, to define a single color for a pixel, I need to go through all the texels here to take the average. So this is inefficient. That is the idea of MIP mapping, to prevent that inefficiency. And the solution is, I use uh, different resolutions of the same texture in my uh, texture image. So it, it will look like this, or like this in a more general example. And the, we then sample from the appropriate resolution during runtime. So this is all in my hand, in my buffer. And in the runtime, based on my distance to camera, I will select this guy. And then to decide the pixel color here, I will be using one pixel, one texel here, or maybe two, or, but it, is, it won't be all the texels here. Okay, so that is the trick. Uh, which comes with a cost of VST. So now, instead of, now I need more memory to keep this texture, right? Because I have multiple copies, but luckily the size of the copies, they decrease exponentially. So in the end, I uh, obviously have more than A uh, amount, but it won't be that big. Uh, Okay, so this is the MIP mapping. Another extremely important concept is bump mapping. So this is the usage of non-color values as textures. Okay, so this will be your text clear image in this scenario, your text clear, let me not say image. This is the text, uh, text clear, and it has all these texels in it. And each texel represents an amount like a scalar value, uh, the, the bigger it is, it will be white, the smaller it is, you go towards uh, black. So what you do in the bump mapping is, you apply these scalars to your vectors, normal vectors, uh, and you change your normal vectors directions using those amounts, uh, like, as indicated by the texel values in random directions, uh, or you can even specify the particular directions, but in the general setting, we just uh, select. Uh, so for instance, here, the uh, texels here, they correspond to the 3D points here apparently. So when I map this sphere or this sphere in this example to this texture space, this part maps to this black hole. 
which means zero movement. So I keep their normals as is. So in the bump mapping, I have the same result here as I have in the same corresponding portion of the uh, original model. But for the other cases, I have non-black values, which make some distortions, like uh, perturbations makes the normals change. Yeah, so bound maps are area of vectors. Uh, so actually, you can even keep the vectors directly instead of I told scholars actually in the beginning, but you can even keep the vector amounts at those vectors directly. But the idea is the same. The idea is you use some value to alter your uh, normal width. And the alternative, you need to be careful here. So with bump mapping, notice that you don't change the geometry. You don't change the coordinates. You just uh, change the normals, which in turn affect your ray tracer or rasterizer, whatever you do your rendering with. And using that weird normal, you have a weird, uh, maybe unexpected coloring, which is sometimes useful, by the way. But the problem is on the shadows. So this is the bump mapping output. Even though it looks like a, a non-smooth surface, its shadow is perfectly smooth. It is because the geometry hasn't changed. And the shadow rays, remember, they are just generated using geometry and the, uh, the shadow rays. So you get this result. If you do displacement mapping, however, you will actually alter the geometry. So you apply those texture vectors to the coordinate vectors, not to the normal vectors. And obviously, if you change the coordinates, then you have to recompute your normals. So in effect, your normals will change as well, which will make you do this non-smooth rendering. And also, since the geometry has changed, it is also visible in the shadow. OK, so you should understand the difference between bump mapping versus displacement mapping. Uh, and finally, this is the last slide, if I remember correctly, environment mapping, a different mapping approach, also known as reflection mapping. So in this scenario, OK, teapot is your object. You place a cube around the object. OK, like this is the cube. This is the open version of cube, as you know, uh, and you like wrap your object with this. Obviously, this is larger than the object. Uh, and then to each six cube faces here, you put some texture, mm -hmm. some image. In this example, I just put uh, colors. It doesn't make much sense. So maybe probably we should use the uh, colors of your environment. OK, so project the environment of the object onto the planes of the cube, onto the faces, like one, two, three, four, five, six faces. Now, during rendering, I create my reflection vectors in my ray tracing. Remember that. Uh, and that reflection vector hits to one of these planes and a point on these planes. And this point, actually, it represents a texel in 2D, so get that texel value and pull it back to your uh, shape, which gives you this teapot, or in this output, it is even better. Uh, like, there is also some uh, reflection. This is a mirror type object. Uh, yeah, so this is the env environment mapping. And also the end of the class. So uh, I can take your questions if you have any questions. And uh, so then I will stop the recording.